We're uh, anxious to uh, hear the remarks of the Honorable Chief Justice Lawton Nuss, who's seated up here at the head table and who Blaine Finch will more completely introduce in just a moment. But I have a few other introductions I would like to do before we actually start, including Blaine Finch, uh, who represents us uh, from the 59th District here in Franklin County and a little bit in Osage, and greatly appreciate the work that he does uh, on a daily basis, really, to provide services to our community as city attorney and also as our state representative to, to Topeka. So thank you, Blaine, thank you for being here and for your uh, ability to uh, introduce Judge Ness here in just a second. We have uh, all five city commissioners in the room. If you'd stand or raise your hand, we've already heard from uh, Mayor Skidmore. Also in attendance today is Blake Jorgensen. Quit trying to take credit from Mike, Blake. <laughs> uh, Sarah, Sarah Kaler, Eric Crowley, and Tom Wigand. And also attending is our city manager, Richard Neinstadt. Uh, we have uh, our county commissioner chairperson, Randy Renaud, in the room. I see he was at the back back there. And uh, with him is our uh, county administrator, uh, Derek Brown. Our county clerk is also here this morning, Janet Paddock, and also on our USDA, uh, USD superintendent of schools, Ryan Cobbs, um, is here, and several members of the school board. Would you stand if uh, you're a member of the school board so we can identify who you are? Thank you, everybody, for being here. We really appreciate. We really appreciate the great leadership that we have in this community, uh, which uh, makes it run smoothly on a daily basis. And so thank you for being here and participating in this event. Blaine, I'm going to have you step up here and uh, keep us moving. Thank you, John. On a personal note, I, I saw you introduce Janet Paddock. I, I just want to say thanks to Janet and all her staff for the work they did in the primary election. You know, it was great as a Franklin County candidate, uh, at least part of my district being in Franklin County, to have the returns come in as smoothly and quickly and professionally as they did in Franklin County, uh, while other areas of the state struggled uh, to say that they could meet the same standard we did here in Franklin County. I think Janet and her staff deserve another round of applause. It is a distinct honor for me to stand before you this morning to deliver an introduction for the Chief Justice of the Kansas Supreme Court, Mr. Lawton Nuss. I am struck in this week as we see the funeral services for Senator John McCain, uh, an American hero, a, a, a man who dedicated his life to public service, first in the military sphere and then the political sphere, but who held true to certain principles. Chief among them, I think, that you can disagree without being disagreeable. And Chief Justice Nuss embodies the notion that many lawyers live by. You've seen the old cartoon where the, the sheepdog and the, and, the, and the fox are going in in the morning and they're just walking along with their lunch pails and they clock in and then they just go at each other all day long and then you clock out and they go head down to the bar to have a beer uh, and talk about the day's events. And that is truly what it, I grew up as a small town county seat lawyer kind of doing, that's, that's what you do. You go to court, you scrap a little bit, you argue vigorously for your client, and you advocate zealously, and then when that's over, you shake hands and you go on to the next one. And it has been a privilege to see the way that Chief Justice Nuss carries himself in Topeka, and he embodies the dignity of the court. It is truly an institution of the people, just like the legislature and the executive branch. But it has never been personal. It has never been um, personally acrimonious. And even when we disagree on some fairly big policy issues in this state, it has always been what it should be, a professional disagreement about the law, about the interpretation of the law, and what it means. And we are fortunate in this state to have a man of his caliber and his character in the position that he is in leading the Kansas Supreme Court. And I can say that the very first case that I had go before Chief Justice Ness, it wasn't, he was, was not Chief Justice at that point, but he wrote the opinion, and we won, and so I like him for that reason as well. <laughs> you might recall, Derek, Randy, Janet, that was a little case about whether or not payroll was a statutory function of the county clerk's office. Um, and that uh, about uh, 15 or so years ago, we, we had a case go up about that. 
Chief Justice Nuss uh, started out his career, he was in the Marines, uh, graduated from the uh, uh, United States Naval Justice School at Newport, Rhode Island, uh, went to KU Law, uh, was a classmate of Sam Brownback, uh, which is kind of interesting how their two careers have intertwined through the years. Uh, he has been very, very loath to tell any good law school stories about his classmate, though. Uh, that, may, that may change this morning. We'll see. <laughs> but as I won't get into what he did in kindergarten and first grade, he told me not to go back quite that far. Uh, but he does have a few things in this, in this uh, resume, in this bio, that I want to point out to you. First, he has served previously as the chairman of the Kansas Judicial Council. That is an important and often overlooked group in this state. Uh, when the legislature gets into something that's a little bigger than they can take care of with a bunch of citizen legislators and 90-day sessions, uh, we ask that the Kansas Judicial Council take up a study of that topic and try to make recommendations back to us. They're working on a, a, a complete uh, overhaul of the state's sex crimes code right now. They're working on a review of the Kansas DUI law, which is in a constant state of flux. Uh, they have worked on issues related to adoption in recent years. Uh, and, and many, many others. That is a very important group, and they often don't get uh, credit for what they do. And uh, our Chief Justice is a former chair of that group, and they do great work, and part of their reputation and legacy uh, is due to his efforts. And so that's worth noting. I think it's also important um, that you note that he was a past member of the Board of Directors of the Conference of Chief Justices. So he has been recognized by other Chief Justices around the country for the work that he does. Uh, and and uh, we oftentimes, whether it's in our community or in our state, uh, we don't take note of the fact when people from here are recognized by folks outside the area for the work that they do. Uh, and, and that is something that is important and of note uh, in his biography. And finally, and this is kind of personal point of pride, in 2011, he was part of the Henry Toll Fellows Program from the Council of State Governments. I was part of the Henry Toll Fellows Program, uh, and that was an amazing opportunity. Uh, to go back to Kentucky uh, and meet with uh, leaders from around the country uh, in various capacities, all three branches of government, and work to develop leadership skills. Uh, and that speaks very highly both of the program and of the Chief Justice that uh, he was part of the Toll Fellows Program. Chief Justice Nuss has five grown children and one grandchild, and he and his wife live in Topeka. Sorry about that. Um, living in Topeka. Uh, but if you ever want to think about commuting, Ottawa is a lovely place, and I'm sure we could find a home for you here, Chief. I'd like you all to join with me in giving a very warm Ottawa and Franklin County welcome to Chief Justice Lawton Nuss. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please be seated. mentioned, I spent four years in Marine Corps, and Marines are not known for having really quiet voices. <laughs> so unless this is necessary for recording, I just as soon put the microphone down and see if you can hear me when I talk like this. That'd be all right? All right, we'll try that. Well, good morning, and uh, thank you for your interest in state government, and in particular, the Kansas judicial branch of government. As Blaine indicated, we all learned in the fifth grade or in middle school that we have three branches of government. And people sometimes say, well, why three? I'd like to answer that by reading a quotation from James Madison, who was one of the people who helped to write the United States Constitution and in order to support its ratification by a sufficient number of states so it would become the law of the land, he wrote a series of articles uh, called The Federalist. Madison said that the accumulation of all powers, legislative, executive, and judiciary, in the same hands, whether of one, a few, or many, and whether hereditary, self-appointed, or elective may justly be pronounced the very definition of tyranny. So that's why the United States government in 1789 had three branches of government. And that's also why the state of Kansas has three branches. For those of you who uh, like history, you recall that in 1859, a group of people met in Wyandotte 
called the Wyandotte Constitutional Convention, and their task was to draft a constitution so it could be approved by Congress, so Kansas could go from being a territory to become a state. And after these folks drafted the constitution, having three branches of government, it went out to a vote of everybody who was living in the territory at the time and who was entitled to vote, and it passed, and that then went to Congress, and they eventually approved it and became a state in January of 1861. So because the people in a statewide vote got to vote on what kind of a constitution they wanted, it is known as the people's constitution. And if we want to change the constitution in Kansas, any amendment has to go out to everybody in the state who is entitled to vote, and they get a chance to vote, yes, we want it, or no, we don't. Okay, let me talk a little bit in detail about our Kansas court system. And some of this may just be a refresher for what you learned many years ago, or you may know just as much about it as I do, and if so, I'm sorry to repeat what you already know. But what sometimes people don't understand is we have two court systems in Kansas. There's the municipal court system. You have a city court in Ottawa. And I'm not here to talk about that. I'm here to talk about the state court system, part of the Kansas Constitution <coughs> Judicial Branch. And I'm going to start with the first rung on that ladder. There are three rungs. And the first one is the district court. That is a court that you have here in Ottawa. And everything is divided in Kansas for these trial courts into judicial districts. This is a judicial district of four different counties. And some of these judges' names that I'm going to run off for you, you probably know, hopefully not as a criminal defendant. <laughs> Uh, judge Taylor Wine, who sits in Coffee County, is the chief judge of the district. Here you have uh, Douglas Whitteman. In Anderson County, Eric Goddards. You have two magistrate judges, Kevin Kimball in Franklin County, Shannon Rush in Osage County. Your district court administrator is John Steelman. And your chief probation officer is Kelly Johnson. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about what that system is. If you watch the exciting shows on television or documentaries or movies or read about it in the books, this is where all the excitement is. The district court that you have, for example, here. This is where all the trials occur. This is where all the lawsuits are initially filed. And these courts hear about every type of case that you can imagine. Criminal cases, of course, and civil cases, such as car accidents, trade secrets, adoptions, contract disputes, that sort of thing. We have 105 counties in Kansas. Every county has at least one courthouse where these kinds of activities go on. Now, what does this mean? How busy are the courts? Well, last year, almost 400,000 cases were filed in the Kansas <laughs> trial courts. This included ab about 21,000 felony cases or very serious crimes, about 14,000 misdemeanor cases, less serious crimes, about 4,000 DUI cases, and we hold about 16,000 people under supervision by probation officers at any one time in the state. Now the good news is we have approximately 2,000 adoptions every year. All right, now this is going to be a little bit of show and tell. I hope you don't mind. Uh, and I'm going to hand out a few things. I'd like to have them back before I leave today. The chief of police has told me he and his Glock pistol will help <laughs> ensure I get it back. Is that a 19? No. No. Okay. I think probably 15 rounds, so if you feel lucky, <laughs> there's your chance. All right. I'm going to show you some things about a trial, a jury trial, 
that goes on in every county across the state. You've heard about transcripts. People who come in to testify swear an oath and they provide testimony. Everything that they say on the witness stand is taken down by a court reporter and then it's typed up into a transcript. Everything said by the judge is put in the transcript. Everything said by the lawyers is in the transcript. This is a transcript. It is part of a first degree murder trial in Wyandotte County. It happens to be from an opinion that I had written for the court. That case is over, so I feel safe in passing this around. You're free to flip through it. Please don't comment on it or spit any tobacco juice, <laughs> Chief. Uh, and I, this is something I would like to have back. Blaine already knows what it is, but if you can pass that on. People hear about these things. Well, what is a transcript? Okay. What happens at that level is the trial, witnesses come in and testify, exhibits are introduced. It might be their murder weapon. In this case, it was a handgun. And all this information goes then to a jury and they make a decision. Live witnesses. Okay. Now, let's say that the case turns out the way that the defendant did not like. That defendant, under Kansas law, has a right to one appeal in the state of Kansas. And he, I'll just call him he at this point, will appeal to the second level of courts in Kansas. That is our court of appeals. And I'm going to pr explain the procedure. That defendant files a brief in which he says, I think that mistakes were made at that trial. And as a result of that, there are consequences of the mistake. Typically, they ask for the conviction to be reversed and sent back to have another trial. So he writes a brief. I'm just going to put these here. In a... His opponent gets to respond and say, no, the judge did not make any mistakes. Or if the judge made mistakes, they're harmless. There's no need to reverse the conviction. Let the conviction stand. So this brief is written in response. The defendant says, well, actually, I'm going to reply to what you said in your brief just now and files a reply brief. Notice these are all different colors. Okay. These then go to our Kansas Court of Appeals along with the transcript and the exhibits, not the Glock pistol. <laughs> we don't allow that to happen. We take pictures of those, and those go to our Court of Appeals. You'll feel free to look through those. As I said, there are no witnesses at the Court of Appeals. Everything that they review is what's called the record on appeal. It would be all the transcripts. It would be all the exhibits. And it would be things not only from the trial itself, but also motions that may have been filed pre-trial. The defendant may have tried to suppress that handgun, saying it was illegally seized by uh, law enforcement. You have jury instructions that the attorneys argue about. They have a separate conference to see what kind of instructions will be given to the jury so they know what law to follow. There may have been some interviews of the defendant taken by law enforcement before the trial. The defendant may have confessed, and that confession is written down and is part of the record as well. Okay, so all of this goes to the Court of Appeals, our second level, and there are a total of 14 judges on the court, but they sit in groups of three to hear a case. And they travel all across the state to hear arguments. They will read the briefs that I'm handing out, and they will read sometimes parts of the record on appeal. For example, if the defendant says, my confession was coerced by the sheriff. They will read the transcript or the written confession of the defendant. Sometimes those confessions are recorded and the judges and their law clerks will watch that DVD to see if in fact somebody threatened the defendant with bodily harm unless he confessed, that sort of thing. 
The attorneys then come to the Court of Appeals. They argue their case. One says, these are all the errors you should reverse, and the other one says, no, there are no errors, or if they were, they were minor. They then get together and they make a decision, and then one of them writes up the decision of the court, and then that is released to the public. All right. Let's say the defendant still has lost, and we have a, a procedure in effect that the party who loses at the Court of Appeals can then ask that appeal to be heard by the Supreme Court. That's the third and final mm -hmm. rung on the ladder. And they file what's called a petition for review. And they tell the Supreme Court all the errors that the Court of Appeals made. And then I wanted to indicate that this is not a right to appeal to us. It's discretionary with the Supreme Court. And we receive about 900 requests like that per year where somebody files a petition for review. Often there is then a response by the other side. And we review those materials to see whether we're going to grant that petition. And if we do, that means, yes, we will hear that case being argued to us. As I said, we had about 900 of these filed last year. We, grant, we granted 70 of them. In my career of 16 years, I have looked at more than 12,000 petitions for review. Okay. Now, when we grant a petition for review and say, yes, we're going to hear the appeal, yes, we get more briefs mm -hmm. telling us in more detail why the Court of Appeals made a mistake. Now, once we do that, the losing party gets to file a supplemental brief. Okay. Now, this is in addition to the Court of Appeals briefs. We'll get those from the Court of Appeals. We've got the petition for review. Then we get the supplemental brief by the losing party. Then we get the response by the winning party. Then we get the reply to the response by the losing party. And then we have something called amicus briefs. These are, par these are <coughs> entities or people who are not involved in that case, but they have an interest in the subject matter. This is an amicus brief. Notice it has a green cover. They're not parties, but they have an interest. And then, of course, you get to reply to the amicus brief. So this would then come to the Supreme Court along with the Court of Appeals briefs, and we read all of that. Now, what I've handed out to you is kind of a small case, actually, and I need to give a disclaimer. We're now all electronic at our courts. Everything is done by computer. So I had to go to our law library and pull some of these old briefs out because we no longer accept written briefs. Okay. This is a small case. These are the briefs in the School of Finance case. Because this case is still pending, I'm not going to hand it around. I'm going to leave it up here. What I can hand out for you, these are the briefs filed by the attorney for Mr. John Robinson. He was a gentleman, you may recall, who was convicted of capital murder for killing women and sticking some of their bodies in barrels in his storage facility. This is all filed by his lawyer. I can hand this around because that case is now out of our hands. We affirm his conviction. We affirm his death penalty. And then, of course, the state gets a chance to respond to Mr. Robinson. And this is the state's response. So now all of these materials are at the Supreme Court and the case is officially with us for a final decision. 
we will hear oral arguments on these cases. We hear about 25 cases a week. And then after the case has been argued, my colleagues and I go to our conference room and we discuss the case. Some of them are easy to decide, others are not so easy. And then we make a decision on how the case is going to be resolved. So the easy cases, it's a unanimous decision. There are seven justices, so it's a seven to zero vote. I then assign one of my colleagues to write up the decision. It goes to all the other colleagues. We get a chance to comment on it saying this language is too harsh or no, I can't quite agree with this particular paragraph. Can you reword it? That sort of thing. Sometimes at conference, we do not have a unanimous decision. Somebody says, I can't agree with that result. And so that justice gets to write what's called a dissenting opinion. He or she will say, here are the reasons why I think the conviction should be reversed instead of affirmed. And then that dissenting opinion circulates among the seven of us. Or it may be that someone says, I agree with the result, affirm the conviction, but I don't agree with your analysis or your rationale. So I'm going to write separately and explain my analytical path. And that is called a concurring opinion. I agree or I concur with the result, I just don't agree with how you got there. Okay. Once we get everything circulated and finalized, it then gets released to the public. All right, we issue about 150 opinions or decisions per year, and we hear cases being argued about every five to six weeks. And somebody here may say, that sounds like a nice job. You only have to work one week every five or six weeks, get to take the summers off, where do I sign up? Well, the problem with that is that once we have heard the case argued, and we've made our decision, you then have a few weeks to try to write the four decisions that have been assigned to you before the next pile of cases comes in on a docket. Then you hear those cases, and then you have to write those decisions. So there is no free time in between the six dockets of cases that we hear every year, and there's no free time during the summer. We're trying to get caught up. Uh, as I mentioned, we hear, we read 900 petitions for review a year. We handle these 150 cases. And there's a lot to be done there. Now, I mentioned about a case like this coming up through from the district court to the Court of Appeals, our second rung on the ladder, and then to us, the third. Cases don't have to go that way. There are certain types of cases that bypass the Court of Appeals. You have a trial here, let's say in Ottawa, and it comes directly to the Supreme Court. A death penalty case would be an example. Or anybody who gets a life sentence, it comes directly to us. There are also some cases that don't even start here. They come directly to the Supreme Court, something called original jurisdiction. A case like that, an example came from Wichita several years ago where the Wichita City Council said, we're going to reduce the penalty for first-time marijuana possessors. It's not going to be as harsh as the state sentence, it's going to be less. So a lawsuit was filed directly in our suit, in our court, to say this is unconstitutional and we want you, court, to issue a Quo warranto writ, which basically says stop the city of Wichita from enforcing that ordinance. Okay. So these are the types of cases that we'll get. And somebody might say, well, it still doesn't sound that hard. That's fine. But keep in mind that we do more than just hear cases. Under the People's Constitution, Article 3, Section 1, here in Kansas, you have told the Supreme Court, we have authority over all courts in the state. Which means the seven justices basically operate as a board of directors and we are responsible for 1,600 employees, about 250 judges, an annual budget of about $140 million. And we also have other things going on. For example, lawyers, 
who want to be licensed to practice in Kansas, we're in charge of the licensing. If a court reporter wants to be licensed, we do the same thing. If judges need to be disciplined, we're in charge of that. If lawyers need to be disciplined, we're in charge of that. Setting uniform child support guidelines for anybody who's been involved in divorce and child support, that comes from us. We have a Client Protection Fund Commission for clients who think they've been abused by their lawyers, wronged by their lawyers, and it costs them money, they can make a claim against that. We speak about 40 different languages in Kansas. We try to provide interpreters for everybody who speaks a language other than English throughout the state. So we have to have qualified interpreters to do that. We're in charge of that. Uh, Blaine made reference to the Kansas Judicial Council. A justice chairs that council. By the way, he neglected to tell you he is also a member. Lots of different activities like this that go on that people I don't think are aware of. They think all we do is hear cases. Uh, we had a strategic planning conference just a couple of days ago to try to go over policy for the next five years for the entire Kansas Judicial Branch. Uh, we have monthly administrative conferences that typically take all day to go through uh, the Code of Ethics for Judges, we make revision to that. Code of Ethics for Lawyers, we make revisions to that. Uh, each justice is in charge of a particular department throughout the state. When I was not Chief Justice, I was responsible for the area that starts in Salina, goes north to Nebraska, and west to Colorado. All six justices have their own areas there as well. They're called departmental justices. So I just wanted to let you know what all the justices do that might be behind the curtain or uh, backstage. And through it all, what I also want to emphasize is if a case comes our way, we are obligated to follow the law. It's called the rule of law. I might have a personal opinion about death penalty. I might have a personal opinion about abortion. I'd have a personal opinion about some other issues, but that is irrelevant to what we're supposed to be doing. Like Blaine, we took an oath to support the Constitution of the United States and of the state of Kansas, and it is our obligation to follow the law and not let the personal interests get involved. Let me give a very graphic example of that. Unfortunately, in Kansas, we have some people who commit sex crimes against children. And those cases oftentimes come to us to resolve. And we read through the transcripts and we see some really heart-rending stories. A child testifying, this is what was done to me. And the argument for that defendant who was convicted is he did not receive a fair trial for whatever reason. And so we look at the law, how it was applied, and as a court we have to decide whether we're going to affirm the conviction or we're going to reverse it and send it back. Now as you read these stories in the transcript, you say to yourself, how could anybody be this cruel, particularly to a child? But if that defendant did not get a fair trial, <coughs> you have to reverse the conviction and send it back. And we know when we do that, that we're putting that child through another trial. We're putting his or her family through another trial and their friends and oftentimes the community through a lot of anguish. And we say, but you have to have a, a fair trial. So, do I stand up here and say I'm for abuse of children because I sent that case back for a retrial? No. I did it because that's what the law required. Okay. I actually have a few things I was going to hand out that you can actually keep instead of just looking at these transcripts. And one of them is our oath of office. As I said, Blaine took the same one. And you can take this with you wherever you go. And I'm going to tell you, the oath 
on that card is prominently displayed on the wall of my chambers in the Judicial Center in Topeka. So every day when I come to work, I see that oath and it reminds me why I'm there. My fidelity is to the Constitution of the people of Kansas that you all approved, or at least your ancestors did, and that's what my job is, to obey the rule of law as started with the Constitution. To be fair and impartial, regardless of where the consequences may be. There's a Latin phrase, I can't give you the Latin, but it is, uh, basically it says, let justice be done though the heavens fall. So justice is that important to the people of Kansas. Uh, I also have some business cards to hand out and my purpose for doing this is not so when you're stopped by the highway patrol <laughs> you can show the trooper and say the Chief Justice and I are drinking buddies uh, we shared a cheeseburger at the bowling alley the other night it's so you know that if you ever want to come to Topeka and tour our building and to come through my chambers and see how I am spending your money, you're the taxpayers, all you have to do is call and set up a time and we will give you that tour. I should also tell you I have some items from the old Supreme Court from over a hundred years ago. Two of those items are spittoons. <laughs> And I have one for male guests and one for female guests. <laughs> and I pride myself in keeping alive the Kansas heritage. I have a map of the state of Kansas on my wall from 1870. So you can look up the population of your town, whether it's your hometown or where you live now. You can see where the railroad, railroads were. You can see the Texas cattle trails leading up from through Indian Territory up to Abilene up to my hometown of Salina, up to Ellsworth, to Wichita, Newton, all that stuff. I think you'll find that at that time Sedgwick County had 4,000 people in it. And uh, it's just a lot of fun to see that old map, old antique furniture from the Supreme Court. The legislature won't let me get new stuff. <laughs> He wasn't even listening to that. We were making a joke at Wichita's expense. Okay, all right. Well, anyway, the spittoons, an old revolving bookcase. I have a fainting couch from the old court. I have an armoire where they used to hang their robes, apparently. Uh, just And for those of you who like Kansas animals, I have a little collection. I have some, it's all from Kansas. I have some rattlesnake rattles from out at Clark County. Uh, I've got a buffalo skull. Uh, buffalo horns, coyote claws. I have a petrified shark's tooth because after all, Kansas had been a shallow sea millions of years ago. Uh, just all kinds of things that you're free to come in. Bring your friends and family. You can set up school tours, the same thing. So we'd, we'd love to have you see how your money's being spent. I only ask, as I said before, that you make an appointment so you don't come during court week when I'm extremely busy. We want to be able to give you the attention that you deserve. So. Let me hand these out. I might have a few more if we do run out. Uh, but I'm very serious about inviting people coming up to see uh, the Kansas Judicial Center. Uh, I might close by saying in my career, uh, I've heard more than 3,500 cases being argued and they were reduced to a written decision. And people may say, well, why are you bothering to write these decisions out? And the reason is because of something called stare decisis, which is Latin for a precedent. If a case comes to us and we make a decision, we like to make that decision and put it on the shelf. So the next time an identical case comes to us, we can, for uniformity and certainty, say, well, we decided that identical case this way last year, it should be decided this way again, and then again, and then again. And then, unfortunately, not all cases are identical. So we get a case that was decided this way on these facts, and a case decided this way on these facts, 
and the case we get is right in between and we have to decide whether it's closer to this one or to that one. So we rely upon these decisions that were made over time so we can apply those same principles and try to be consistent. Because particularly for lawyers, if you have a client who comes in and the client says, can you explain to me what's going to happen at the Kansas Supreme Court? Blaine, I don't want him to say, I have no idea. <laughs> they are so unpredictable. Day after day after day, it's just wild stuff. I don't have any way of telling you that. And the client says, well, how do I know whether I should appeal or not and pay you your exorbitant legal fee? You should. You should. <laughs> <laughs> and Blaine says, I, it's a crapshoot. We just don't know. Well, we want to reduce that, if not totally eliminate it, so that there is some certainty here when people know where they stand. And if Blaine says, I've looked at the case law, you're going to lose. Most people would say, I don't have the money to fight this battle. I'm going to quit. Some people may say, no, I'm right. I'm going to try to get that opinion changed. Blaine, go up there and spend all the money I gave you and argue. And sometimes that happens. We reverse precedent because it's no longer valid. Okay. Anybody have any questions that I can try to answer for you? Is, yes. Has there ever been a case where, even though the laws haven't changed, where you reverse the precedent not because it's no longer valid, but because the current sitting judges disagree with uh, the rulings of previous cases? The the closest that comes to mind, it's very recent, is a case that involved forcible felonies. And a forcible felony is not a murder necessarily, but let's say it's a, a kidnapping, something like that. And the issue was whether you're allowed to assert self-defense if there's a forcible felony that's being committed. And our court came out one way uh, a few years ago, and I dissented in the case, along with two other colleagues. And then uh, we heard a similar case being argued a few years later, and one of my colleagues changed the mind of the judge. Uh, we got new briefing on the issue. Uh, I talked with my colleague and said, I still feel this way and here's the research that I did and I hope you'll see things this way and that colleague changed and uh, that's the way the case is coming out. Uh, but there are also times when you just say, this was poor law to begin with. And the example that often is given is a case in the 1890s called Plessy versus Ferguson that you're all familiar with and with which the United States Supreme Court said, hey, segregation in schools, that's okay. And coincidentally, the only person from Kansas who ever sat on the U.S. Supreme Court was on the court at that time, but he had come back to Kansas because his daughter, I think, was in real ill health or had just died. His name was David Brewer. So he was not present for that decision, uh, and there was one dissenter who said the Constitution is colorblind. And then in 1954, with that case of Brown versus Topeka Board of Education, the U.S. Supreme Court said no, racial segregation in schools is not legal, it is unconstitutional. So that was 60 years later when they came to that conclusion. Uh, the Supreme Court has also changed course on uh, what used to be called homosexuality as a crime. Uh, that whole process took, I think, about 20 years to go from one area to another. Uh, and that bleeds into other areas as well, such as uh, same-sex marriage. I think 20 years ago, had it come to the U.S. Supreme Court, they would have ruled one way, and now, of course, they've ruled another way. So it's some justices keep an eye on public opinion, some people just look strictly at the law and say it's always been wrong or somebody like my colleague says you know I've been thinking about it and thinking about it and yeah I I agree this is the way it should be 
but it's never my personal philosophy is I'm against this, so I'm always going to be this way. You just have to do what the law requires. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. How, how do you answer uh, those legislators that accuse the court of being an activist court rather than an interpretive court, uh, where you maybe lean towards the, you know, they don't, you don't agree with the legislature, but on, on some things that they're saying, you know, we make the laws, you interpret them rather than try to sway one way or the other in the legislature? You get my question. I do. It's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> I think I would go back to our basic constitution of the people of Kansas and say, here's what the constitution says. If you don't like the way that we are upholding the constitution, then get it changed. And there is a process in our constitution to do that. Uh, it has to pass both chambers, the Senate and the House, two-thirds vote. Then it has to survive the governor's veto, and if not, they have to override it. And then it goes to a vote of everybody in Kansas who's entitled to vote. And you get to decide how you want it. Uh, if it's not a constitutional question, but a law that the legislature passed that we uh, interpreted, uh, then the message to the legislature is change the law. You don't have to go to the people for that. You can do it within the legislature, and if the governor overrides, then you, I'm sure, governor vetoes, and you uh, can attempt to override the veto. So there's there are processes in place to get that done, uh, and that would be my answer that it is not a waste of anybody's time. There are procedures that can be done. One last question. We got a three-way tie here, but I think the woman in the. Uh, I just wanted to ask, with all the crazy going on in some of the states, do you foresee a time when, when uh, non-citizens of Kansas are going to expect to be able to vote in the election? Non-citizens? Yes. I'm trying to phrase that nicely. Immigrants or whatever you want to call. Non-U.S. citizens. Non-U.S. citizens. California, for instance. I think. I that's think. Going to be a challenge one of these days. Mm -hmm. Well, the clerks over there. <laughs> <laughs> my my answer to that is a reminder that the Supreme Court doesn't go out into Kansas looking for cases. Not looking for trouble. Not looking for trouble. <laughs> Uh, the cases are brought to us, and it would be up to somebody filing a lawsuit and attorneys bringing that to us, and then we would make a decision. So until something like that happens, I don't think I should be venturing an opinion on what might happen. I understand why you might ask that question. I understand. I think we're being cut off. Yes, my <laughs> Let's give a hand for Uh, when I get home tonight, my wife's going to ask me, what did you learn today? I said, well, I, I learned that briefs come in many, many colors. <laughs> uh, I didn't, so anyway. But anyway, we do have some goodies here for the Chief Justice. We have a, a mug from the city and some goodies in there, so I'll give that to you. I also have a key to the city. A key to the city represents uh, honor, trust, and a welcome back anytime. So I want you to know that. Now, word of the wise, I've tried this in all the banks in town, and it does not work. <laughs> so trust me on that one. But anyway, congratulations. Thanks for being here, Chief Justice. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, we have one more presentation here. Yeah. Sure. And also, uh, on behalf of the Chamber's Legislative Action Committee and the Chamber of Commerce of Ottawa, we really appreciate the, you being here this morning and sharing remarks, and we'd like to present you with this Ottawa Chamber uh, plaque. So, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Appreciate really, you. greatly appreciate you being here. Happy to be here. <laughs> with your permission, the next time Blaine Finch comes to the Supreme Court courtroom to argue a case, 
I'm going to put this on the bench in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> and his opponent will, le will lean over the table and whisper, Blaine, what's all this about? And Blaine will say, don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, Judge Ness, I can guarantee you we don't trust Blaine with the key to the city. So. <laughs> I just have a few uh, other recognitions that I want to do quickly this morning. First of all, uh, the uh, Legislative Action Committee, uh, which puts on candidate forums and the uh, legislative coffees, also puts this on. Richard Jackson, the chairperson of that committee, was out of state today and would have loved to have been here and would have been doing more of the role that I'm doing this morning had he been present. But uh, they do great work. They're listed in your program. I also uh, want to mention that this is sponsored by AT&T and hosted here by Ransom Memorial Hospital. <clears throat> Matt, we greatly appreciate uh, you hosting us here, put this on every year. It's been a, uh, it's a great event and uh, we always sell out and I see we have some vacant seats, but uh, we, we sold 83 tickets to come to this this morning. So uh, the other, t I'd, I'd also like to mention uh, my staff, Sherry at Lund and Brandon Wilcox, uh, without which most events wouldn't get pulled off. So. Thank you all for coming this morning. Appreciate you being here, and uh, we'll uh, see you back next year when we bring another intriguing political voice to our community.